<laughs> Hi, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome. My name is Crystal Chumney, and I'm the manager of public services here at New Canaan Library. We are delighted to host Eva Dillon at the library this evening to discuss her new book, Spies in the Family. A special thank you to Elm Street Books for supporting this event. Spanning 50 years and three continents, Spies in the Family is a deeply researched account of two families on opposite sides of the lethal espionage campaigns of the Cold War and the two men whose devoted friendship lasted a lifetime until the devastating final days of their lives. With impeccable insider access to both families, as well as knowledgeable CIA and FBI officers, Eva goes beyond the fog of secrecy to craft an unforgettable story of friendship and betrayal, double agents and clandestine lives that challenges our notions of patriotism, exposing the commonality between peoples of opposing political economic systems. Published by HarperCollins in May of this year, it has since been awarded a prestigious Kirkus Star, has been selected as the Book of the Month by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post, and has received glowing reviews from the American Scholar, Vice, Library Journal Reviews, and the New York Literary Magazine, among other prestigious critics. Eva spent 25 years in the magazine publishing business in New York City, including stints at Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Glamour, The New Yorker, and as president of Reader's Digest U.S. She and her six siblings grew up moving around the world for her father's CIA assignments in Berlin, Mexico City, Rome, and New Delhi. <coughs> she holds a bachelor's degree for, uh, for in music from Virginia Commonwealth University and lives in Charleston, South Carolina. Please join me in welcoming Eva to the stage. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you all for coming tonight. Let me just check my AV here. Um, one of the things that uh, people often say to me is how fortuitous it is that my book is coming out now, my Cold War story, with all of its parallels to today's burgeoning new Cold War, which we are all fervently hoping stays a Cold War. For marketing reasons, uh, sure, I suppose I'm glad for the timing. If we have to have another Cold War, and we don't, but it seems we are, then sure, my book is serendipitously timed. To any future readers of the book out there, I hope that you will find in it and learn from the many parallels to what's going on today. The fear of imminent nuclear war, the leaks and betrayals um, uh, behind suspicion of so Soviet meddling and collusion, the sudden unexplained disappearance of more than 10 American intelligence assets all then and now. But there is one factor from the Cold War of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, which is underappreciated today as we embark on similarly perilous times. And it's the main focus of attention and purpose in my book, which is the importance of and be uh, belief in our intelligence agencies to tap into human intelligence by building trust and communication between assets and handlers, that talented individuals in intelligence fields can actually do something as hyperbolic sounding as saving the world, which we might need around here sometime soon. The spy stories of many intelligence individuals throughout our wars and cold wars have been told, but rarely do we learn about the human interest side of these stories, how geopolitics between governments uh, affect real people and their families in profound ways. I'm going to start by reading a short excerpt from the beginning of the book, the prologue, which in chronological time is actually the end of the story. So here's how it begins. In May of 1988, in his eighth and final year in office, President Ronald Reagan traveled to Moscow for his fourth summit with General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev. No other American president had held as many summits with a Soviet leader. By then, the Cold War was winding down. Gorbachev had shown his reformist colors early in his tenure as General Secretary, and by 1988, there, were far more, there was far more openness in what had been, since its founding, a grim police security state. Soviet citizens were beginning to enjoy freedoms that were unheard of in earlier times. 
Reagan and Gorbachev had struck up a civil relationship that grew friendlier as they made progress on arms reduction. A certain chemistry does exist between us, Reagan wrote in his diary. At one of their meetings, Reagan gave Gorbachev a pair of cufflinks engraved with the figures of swords being beaten into plowshares, a traditional symbol of peace. Walking with Gorbachev on the Kremlin grounds during a break from meetings, Reagan was asked by a reporter about his famous evil empire speech of five years earlier. I was talking about another time, another era, he replied. His optimism for the future of the Soviet people was evident in a speech he gave on that first visit to students at Moscow State University. Your generation is living in one of the most exciting, hopeful times in Soviet history. It is a time when the first breath of freedom stirs the air and the heart beats to the accelerated rhythm of hope when the accumulated spiritual energies of a long silence yearn to break free. In between formal meet summit meetings, Reagan pulled Gorbachev aside for a private conversation. The United States would be appreciative if the USSR would pardon a Soviet prisoner who had been arrested as a spy for America or trade him for a Soviet incarcerated in the United States. Gorbachev sent an assistant to look into the prisoner's status. When the assistant came back, Gorbachev turned to Reagan. Mr. President, he said, I will have to disappoint you. The man you are asking us to pardon is dead. His sentence for spying was carried out two months ago. So unfortunately, we missed it by two months. Uh, that Soviet is the main character in the book, General Dmitry Polyakov, our country's longest serving, highest ranking Cold War asset. Paul Dillon, my father, was the CIA case officer, or handler as they are called, who developed a close working and personal relationship with Polyakov in the 60s and 70s. The fact that my father was a CIA operative was not something any of us Dillon children knew until the summer of 1975 when I was 17 and a newspaper article identified my father as a CIA officer. We were living in New Delhi, India at the time and my six brothers and sisters and I had always assumed that dad worked for the State Department. That article from the Times of India, the English speaking paper there, was headlined, Mystery Document Identifies CIA Men in India, and said that a document identifying three United States diplomatic personnel in India as US Central Intelligence Agency officials was received in several news organizations today. The document named Paul L. Dillon, first secretary and consul in the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, and identified him as the Paul Dillon mentioned in Philip Agee's book as the person who headed up the CIA's satellite Soviet operations in Mexico. Now, we kids didn't know who Philip Agee was, but the CIA certainly did. A case officer who had become disgruntled with the agency quit and had written a tell-all book inside the company CIA diary, which revealed the identities of 250 covert officers around the world, including my father, for whom AG had worked in Mexico City seven years <laughs> earlier. This blockbuster book, exposing CIA secrets around the world, was, of sorts, the CIA's WikiLeaks scandal of the 1970s. Yet, even after the book came uh, out and my father's cover was blown, my parents still weren't inclined to tell us about dad's career. My father wasn't all of a sudden going to start telling us what he was really doing at work all day. So when he died five years later in 1980 at the age of 54 of a rare hereditary lung disease, we Dylan kids were still pretty much in the dark. A question I get a lot is what motivated me to write the book? There were two reasons. The first, because of a box we found in my mother's attic after she died in 1977, 17 years after my father. The box contained a collection of documents and papers. We took it downstairs, and later, while my siblings and I were sitting around the dining room table talking about arrangements for selling the house, my husband pulled a magazine out of the box and started reading. Hey, he said to us, your dad's name is in this article. He handled this Soviet general during the Cold War whose code name was Top Hat. It was in an October 1977 issue of George Magazine. Does anyone here remember George Magazine? Yes. John John Jr. short-lived magazine of the 90s. And this was the spy issue commemorating the 50th anniversary of the CIA. 
Now that is supermodel Elizabeth Hurley with a gun, and I am sure that's exactly how the women of the CIA walked down the halls of Langley. <laughs> I mean, come on. I started reading the article. Our man in Moscow, his code name, Top Hat. His mission, to use his position as a Soviet intelligence officer to spy on the Russians for the United States. General Polyakov served this country for 18 years as the CIA's highest ranking Soviet agent. Then he was betrayed. Intrigued, I read on. Top Hat was sent as a military attache to India, where Paul L. Dillon, an ex-Marine from Boston, was dispatched to serve as his CIA case officer. In the pantheon of super agents, Top Hat occupies a special place. Wow. My mother, probably keeping a vow to my father not to reveal anything during their lifetimes, hadn't wanted to tell us herself, but it clearly wanted us to know by leaving behind the article and other documents. And that, in those pre-internet days before news found you rather than you finding it in a dusty box up in an attic, is when I uh, discovered the magnitude of my father's private career. I then wanted to know more about my father's career, of course, but set out to learn even more about the Soviet general, this super agent spy called Top Hat. Why was he so important? What was the nature of his relationship with my father? What political impact did their collaboration have? I wondered also what kind of life the general had led in Russia on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Did he have children? What was it like for them to grow up in the Soviet Union with a spy for a father compared to us? And what was the betrayal the magazine mentioned? So I decided to find out. Over the course of three years, I interviewed more than 20 of my father's former colleagues and other intelligence professionals, and trust me, it wasn't easy finding them. It's their nature to be under the radar. In addition to the interviews, I culled research from investigative journalists and spy book writers, from CIA and FBI reports, and from various media from Russia and the former Soviet Union, which I had translated. By far, my most cherished source was the general's son, Alexander Polyakov, here with his mother, Nina, in 1975, who, I discovered, had immigrated with his brother to the United States in 1999, in an intriguing story in and of itself that's detailed in the book, and was willing to save, share his memories with me. And what came out of all of this research is an intimate double family memoir within the broader Cold War history spanning 50 years and three continents. And what about the, that timing? With questions about Putin's and Trump's relationship and its potential consequences making headlines daily, which Cold War, we might ask? Although, I don't seem to recall a bromance between the heads of the superpowers <laughs> in the earlier Cold War. <laughs> Forgive me, I could not help myself. <laughs> Uh, but more seriously, the second reason I wrote the book was to document and honor one person in particular, the book's main protagonist and my primary motivation for writing it, and hence the book's dedication to Dmitry Fedorovich Polyakov, his life and 18 years of service to our country, who himself was motivated to do what he could to lessen the possibility of nuclear war between the superpowers. James Woolsey, CIA director under President Clinton, said of Polyakov after his death, among all the secret agents recruited by the United States during the Cold War, Polyakov was the jewel in the crown. What General Polyakov did for the West didn't just help us win the Cold War, it kept the Cold War from becoming hot. During the course of my research, the more I learned about Polyakov, here at a diplomatic reception in New Delhi with his wife Nina, the more I was struck by how unique he was among assets who worked for the United States. He was not tempted by the luxuries of the West, a weakness which compromised other Soviet assets, nor did he ask for money or asylum, also unusual. Rather, he was motivated by a desire to lessen the very real threat of nuclear war by helping the Americans better interpret the Soviet leadership's thinking and intentions. At the height of the Cold War, Dmitry Polyakov offered the CIA an unfiltered view into the vault of Soviet intelligence. He disclosed intelligence on Soviet military planning, nuclear missile systems, and chemical and biological weapons research. He photographed thousands of pages of top secret documents from the KGB and GRU. The GRU is military intelligence, the agency Polyakov worked for. 
Some of those documents, for example, detailed the American military technology their agents were directed to steal. Those orders, issued annually by the Soviet Military Industrial Commission, startled American analysts at the time with their detailed knowledge of classified American systems. The Soviets' technology gathering effort revealed by Polykov was breathtaking, according to Richard Pearl, then Assistant Secretary of Defense. As he said, we found there were 5,000 separate Soviet programs that were utilizing Western technology to build up their military capabilities. The documentation Polyakov provided spurred the U.S. to severely tighten controls on Western military technology. Polyakov was key to informing the CIA on the Sino-Soviet political rift, which eventually led to President Nixon's historic visit to China in 1972. And perhaps most important, Polyakov disclosed to the Americans the Soviet government's belief that it could not prevail in a nuclear confrontation with the U.S., significantly degrading the Kremlin's ability to threaten America and her allies and diffusing tensions, eventually leading to disarmament talks between the superpowers. In an article in Time magazine years later, in, 1980, in 1994, when Polyakov's death was reported, in which they called him a perfect spy, Robert Gates, CIA director under George H.W. Bush, said, there were a lot of debates at the time over Soviet military strategy and doctrine in terms of how their forces would be used in a war. P Polyakov's Purloin's documents gave us insights into how they talked to each other about these issues, whether they thought that victory uh, in a nuclear war was possible. The answer, thankfully, was no. Polyakov provided the Soviet uh, uh, proved that the Soviet military leaders were not crazy warmongers, that they were as worried as their Ameri American counterparts were. This insight, said Director Gates, may have prevented U.S. miscalculations that would have touched off a shooting war. Some of Polyakov's perloid documents were left at dead drop sites around Moscow, uh, part of the trade craft, as it was called, such as this one in a training photo provided to Polyakov by the CIA. It's a bench in Gorky Park where Polyakov was instructed to leave documents concealed in a container and hidden behind a crack between the bench and the wall, as indicated by the handwritten B and C circles. A CIA employee posing as a tourist for the photo was cut out for security reasons. The book benefit, the book features a number of never before seen photos of Polyakov's communication and training materials for any of you tradecraft junkies out there. This picture was taken inside the FSB, the former KGB, spy museum in Moscow. And it's actually not in the book because it's a successor version to a very cool two-way transceiver device. It's the little Walkman-sized device circled here and hidden inside a speaker that has been removed from a 1970s boombox. My father and the CIA developed the device solely for Polyakov just before he returned to Moscow from New Delhi in 1976. While in Delhi, Polyakov was promoted to general, and the CIA did not want to subject such a high-ranking asset to the limited, painstaking, and dangerous system of dead drops and signal sites that agents had, and handlers had used in Moscow for decades. So 20 years before text messaging devices would be introduced to the public, the CIA developed the short-range, high-speed, two-way encrypted communications device that had no precedent in either the espionage or civilian worlds. The boombox was used as a concealment device to smuggle the transceiver past customs into Russia. The transceiver had a tiny Cyrillic script keyboard and dispatched messages in bursts of 2.6 seconds from Polyakov's coat pocket as he rode past the American embassy on the Moscow tram. Suitably codenamed Unique, it was a te technical leak in covert communications equivalent to the telephone in public communications. In a primitive form, Unique possibly represented the world's first test messaging exchanges, said Robert Wallace, former CIA director of the Office of Technical Service. For you James Bond fans out there, Wallace was Q. <laughs> so who was Polyakov really? For starters, a decorated World War II hero. Here he is as a young captain towards the end of the war. After the war, he was trained at the prestigious Fruins Military Academy and was recruited by the USA, by the GRU, excuse me. In 1951, 
He was sent to the United States as a member of the Soviet mission to the United Nations Security Council Military Staff Committee. That, of course, was his official role, his cover. In fact, his first GRU job was to run the network of Soviet illegals operating in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s. Anyone here watch The Americans, the show on FX? Yeah, a lot of people. Yes, like Philip and Elizabeth, only, only the real ones don't do karate and stuff dead bodies into car trunks. They got themselves hired into sensitive positions in research and technology companies and stole military secrets to, uh, for the GRU, passing them to Polyakov, who in turn passed them on to Moscow Center. But after a few years in the US, here with his son Alexander in New York in 1960, Polyakov underwent an ideological evolution that resulted in his volunteering his services to the United States. He offered to become a double agent. His motivations were unusual, as he did not do it for money or asylum, but for ideological reasons. Polyakov considered himself to be a Russian patriot who wanted to help the Russian people. He was a hero of the Great Patriotic War, and sometime after the war, it is believed he began to view the Soviet leaders as corrupt thugs mocking the sacrifices that the Russian people made during the war. He disliked Khrushchev with a passion, considering him an uncouth bore, prone to emotional or, uh, uh, outbursts such as the legendary, we are turning out missiles like sausages, quote. When he, Polyakov, was in the UN General Assembly in 1960, and Khrushchev infamously lost his temper and hit his desk with his shoe, Polyakov was deeply embarrassed. By the way, there is no known picture or video of the famous incident, and that widely circulated picture with the shoe was actually cropped in. I just liked it and wanted to use it. <laughs> Nonetheless, Polyakov believed uh, Khrushchev's erratic and emotional outburst threatened the uneasy peace between the superpowers, and he wanted to help Americans better, better interpret Soviet leaders' thinking and intentions in a quest to avoid nuclear war. One day in the fall of 1961, Polyakov requested to meet, with, meet clandestinely with Lieutenant General Edward O'Neill, head of the American UN military staff at his quarters on Governor's Island in New York. In that secret meeting, which was being recorded by the FBI, Polyakov requested to be put in touch with a CIA officer. The book features the never-before-published transcript of the tape of that meeting, which was secretly recorded by the FBI and was furnished to me by the agent who did the recording. The FBI instead uh, set him up with one of their own, an FBI agent masquerading as a CIA officer, a ruse that continued until uh, Polyakov went to Boyuk, uh, Burma in 1966. A principal man motivated by love for his country, Polyakov wanted to help the Americans, but that didn't mean he was a champion for the causes of freedom, justice, and democracy. His Russian roots ran too deep for that. Asked by the FBI if he would ever consider defecting to the US with his wife and children, Polyakov's answer was no. I was born a Russian and I will die a Russian, he said. It was in New York and Burma where Polyakov and my father first met, but it was in India where they became close after we moved there in 1973. Polyakov had a reputation inside the CIA of being unknowable and humorless, perhaps because of a succession of handlers who did not believe in his bona fides, which I'll explain in a moment. But all of that changed with my father. Dad was warm and sentient. Here with my mother at a fair outside of Munich in 1951, noticed the army uniform, which was his cover at the time, when in fact he was parachuting ref refugees who were running from the communists overtaking their countries, parachuting them back into Russia for a secret CIA operation codenamed Red Sox, another dramatic story in the book. Anyway, dad was warm and unguarded and imparted a preternatural sense of trustworthiness, traits even the KGB would later acknowledge. Sandy Grimes, a longtime colleague of my father's on the Polyakov, case, wrote in her book about my father's assignment to handle Polyakov. Polyakov's new case officer was Paul Dillon, one of our finest. He was not selected for the assignment just because of the quality of his Russian language of, of more import were his operational skills and human qualities. He was a devout Catholic, and when he was out of earshot, his subordinates respectfully and affectionately called him Father Paul. He never demanded the respect and loyalty of those he le led. He unknowingly commanded it with his wit, charm, and unassuming ways. 
certainly a moving tribute for this daughter to read. My father worked closely with Polyakov in India for three years, hunting with his asset in the Himalayan foothills and fly fishing on the Yamuna River, away from prying eyes and listening devices as they became friends and partners in espionage. But the fact is that both men were involved in a very dangerous game, especially Polyakov. Their final meeting came unexpectedly while we were in New Delhi. My father had recently been di diagnosed with that lung ailment that he knew was terminal, a fact he did not share with his children. And so it was understood that he and Polyakov would never see each other again after we returned to the States for dad's medical treatment. Then a few weeks later, Polyakov was ab abruptly recalled to Moscow. The CIA was alarmed with good reason. Any unplanned recall was worrisome in the world of Soviet espionage as the asset being recalled could be under suspicion and sometimes vanish upon return to Moscow. To protect him, the CIA again offered Polyakov asylum in the US, but he refused, saying once more, I was born a Russian and I will die a Russian. What will happen to you if your work for us is discovered, he was asked. Bratskaya Mogila, Polyakov replied, an unmarked grave. And so Polyakov boarded a plane and returned to his homeland. My father passed away after that, not knowing the fate of his Russian friend. I won't tell any more of the plot line after this, as I can't give it all away, and I hope that you will read the book to find out what happens. But the book does more than tell my father's and Polyakov's espionage career stories. It also tells the larger story of the Cold War environment they were operating in at the time, and also features stories about these headliners, among many others. It's a story of James Angleton, the infamous Machiavellian and powerful chief of the CIA's counterintelligence division who suffered from paranoia, perfect for a counterintelligence chief, right? <laughs> and who, along with his black hat followers, believed in a vast Soviet uh, master plot that was infiltrating and crippling the CIA. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Interesting how back then, people within the agency believed in a Soviet meddling plot even though it was never proven. And today, a Soviet meddling plot has been proven, but it is not believed. <laughs> Angleton specifically believed that Polyakov was a provocation, a fake agent sent to the US to confuse and derail US intelligence operations, pulling strings resulting in Polyakov's first two handlers prior to my father being black hat followers of Angleton's serpentine conspiracy theories, endangering Polyakov's work and eventually his life. It's the story of Special Agent Ed Moody on the right, the young FBI agent who was assigned to tail Polyakov during his nine years in New York City at the UN. Moody was the one hiding in the basement of General O'Neill's quarters, operating the recording equipment when Polyakov offered to work for the United States and, and who gave me a copy of the tape of that meeting. Here he is on board the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth Cunard ocean liner with his FBI boss, covertly accompanying Polyakov back to Europe after the end of Polyakov's second tour in the US. I'm going to read another short excerpt about one of the ways Ed Moody and the FBI and CIA communicated with Polyakov in Moscow after his return from New York in 1962. Now, before I read the ex excerpt, I should explain that uh, Polyakov had earlier made his first dead drop in Moscow a microchip embedded in a Band-Aid which he placed under a bench in a subway station for the CIA to pick up. Before Polyakov left New York, he had, set, he had suggested to Special Agent Ed Moody a new way of communicating while he was in Moscow via coded secret messages inserted into the New York Times personal ads. As a GRU colonel, Polyakov had access to the American newspaper prohibited to ordinary Russians. Drop sites would be men's names, Art, Bob, Charles. Signal sites would be women's names, Betty, Clara. Meanwhile, Polyakov would check the GRU's copy of the newspaper regularly. Several weeks after Polyakov left the Band-Aid under the Metro bench, a brief ad appeared as a public notice in the Times. Moody, Donald F., late of New NYC. Letter from Art received. Everyone fine except Cousin Phil, who has not been located for settlement of a state. Perhaps you can locate him. Uncle John sends his regards. Please get in touch with brothers Edward and John F. Kloster, New Jersey. Donald F. was code for Dmitry Fedorovich. 
letter from Art was received meant that the CIA had picked up the Band-Aid from the Metro drop code named Art. Moody, at the, start of the, uh, at the start, and Brother Edward, toward the end, identified the sender, and John F. was Moody's supervisor. The rest of the ad was filler. Ed Moody, who had placed the ad, had to use his real name and address, Closter, New Jersey, because the newspaper required that individuals placing personal ads identify themselves and provide their correct, verifiable name and address. Even the FBI, engaged in a high-risk clandestine operation, had to bow to the rules of the New York Times. <laughs> the message ran for 12 days, from September 19th through September 30th, 1962, against the chance that Polyakov's bureau might not receive the Times on any particular day. Yet all those consecutive days aroused the suspicion of the Grey Lady's ad editor, who decided to check on whether the ads were legitimate. Ed Moody was asked to come down to the Times and explain himself. <laughs> When he arrived for the appointment, he showed his ID and told the editor that he was a special agent for the FBI. The ad had to do with a case that he was not authorized to discuss, though the Times was free to call his supervisor to confirm. The editor did call, and only then did he allow the ad to continue. You got to love the New York Times. Uh, so over the years, Agent Moody came to respect and admire Polyakov, doing everything in his power to prove to his FBI superiors that Polyakov was not a fake agent, uh, like Angleton, the CIA counterintelligence chief, believed, but a genuine asset working in the interest of the United States. There's a funny story in the book involving Moody, a Keystone Cops-like episode that happened on board the ship with a large stash of photos of Soviet officers, but you're going to have to read it in the book. It's the story of my father, here on the right, standing in front of the Soviet pavilion at the Brussels World Fair in 1958, sent as part of the CIA's effort to infiltrate copies of the great Russian writer Boris Pasternak's novel, Dr. Zhivago, into the Soviet Union. The book had been banned in Russia for its humanist, individualistic story and its criticism of Stalinism, collectivization, and the Great Purge. More than 14,000 Soviets attended the Brussels Fair that year, and my father's job was to clandestinely pass copies of the books to them to carry back into the Soviet Union, allowing its citizens to read the work of one of their own literary masters, a work that reflected the truth about their lives under communist oppression. And then there's the story of Aldrich Ames, our country's most notorious CIA mole, a careless and alcoholic ac uh, officer who wanted to offer his new Colombian wife a life of luxury in the United States and sold secrets to the KGB to do it, secrets most of us you can guess at, which were acutely re relevant to the story. It's the story of Sandy Grimes. Don't you just love the fashions of the 60s and 70s? <laughs> who joined the agency in 1971 and worked with my father supporting the Polyakov case at headquarters for over 20 years. She rose through the ranks of the CIA, standing down the sexism that many women faced in the workplace in the 60s and 70s, and apparently today, <laughs> and uh, outsmarted her male CIA colleagues when she was the one to unmask Aldrich Ames, the mole that had been operating right under their noses for over eight years. It's the story of Viktor Belenko, the Soviet pilot who defected from Russia with a super secret MiG-25 Foxback jet. Anyone remember when Belenko flew to Japan? Yeah, I see some hands back there in, with the MiG-25 in 1975. It was what worldwide news. My father became his handler uh, after he came back from India and was responsible for helping to assimilate him uh, into American culture. Viktor hung around our suburban Washington, D.C. house a lot and had Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners with us. That's me on the left uh, and Victor Belenko on the right. We Dylan kids in our teens and 20s at that point had no idea who Victor really was. He had a fake identity for security reasons. He told us he was East German and we were none the wiser. My husband and I met with Victor 36 years later in 2012 for an interview for the book in an undisclosed location in the Midwest. It had not been easy finding him because Belenko still keeps a low profile for security reasons. All these years later, it took the help of Chuck Yeager, the famous retired Air Force general who broke the speed of sound, to get a message to him that I wanted to see him for an interview, which was an emotional and rewarding reunion for the both of us. 
And just last fall, on the 40th anniversary of his September 16, 1976 flight to the West, Victor called to remind me of the anniversary and to tell me again how my father saved his life, an emotional and touching story which is in the book. And finally, intertwined among all these stories of spies and traitors and defectors are the experience of our families, the Dillons and the Polyakovs growing up on opposite sides of the Cold War, how different our upbringings were, and yet how much we had in common. But in the end, the Polyakovs' experience had a finality so much more colossal and heartbreaking than ours ever would or could. Lastly, I'll answer a question now that I get a lot, which is, if Polyakov was such a significant asset to the United States, why had no book been written about him before? The answer is that these types of books, about Cold War spies, for instance, are usually written by journalists or historians, and they write books when they've gotten access to new troves of information, preferably newly, newly declassified. Polyakov's case remains classified, and probably will, for up to 30 years. I did not believe that General Polyakov's story should wait for 30 years. So I came at it quite differently, relying heavily on my interviews with more than 20 of my father's former colleagues and friends, the FBI, and most critically and extensively with the general's son, Alexander, and his family. But I didn't want to write the book that a journalist or a historian would and should write someday. I wanted to write a book by a daughter, infusing the personal human interest aspect into an incredible Cold War story as it revealed itself to me and to and Alexander Polyakov. So I seized the opportunity to tell my father's and Polyakov's remarkable story as a journalist could not, from the perspective of a daughter and a son, in all of its newsworthy and human ways. Now, let me close with one more excerpt, this time representing the more personal memoir side of the story about my father and, and my family. All right, here we have just moved to New Delhi in 1973. Dad took up his cover position as first secretary at the American Embassy, an imposing wedding cake of a building only two blocks from the Soviet compound. When we arrived, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was the US ambassador, a larger than life man who later became ambassador to the United Nations and long-term senator from New York. Dad and Moynihan developed a close relationship, and my brother Leo and Moynihan's son John became good friends. Moynihan was outgoing and friendly to everyone, including the diplomat's children, and we all liked him. While we were there, a new bowling alley opened in the embassy compound, and Moynihan hosted a dedication ceremony. John Moynihan told, told the boys that his father was a terrible bowler and would probably gutter the inaugural bowl. The boys challenged the ambassador to a bet. 10 rupees, $1.25 each, that he would miss all the pins. The ambassador took them up on it and playfully told the gathering about the bet with the kids. Moynihan's first ball knocked over several pins and he rakishly made the boys pay up on the spot to the, to the delight of his audience. One evening, John Moynihan invited my brother Leo to the Roosevelt House for a sleepover. Mrs. Moynihan told the boys to stay in their rooms upstairs because there was a reception for the Indian interior minister going on in the hall below. The reception was a bigger deal than usual because the then Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, visiting India at the time, was one of the guests. Nonetheless, the boys sneaked out of their room to watch the proceedings from the balcony overhead. As the interior minister took his turn addressing the company, the boys saw Mr. Dooley, the Moynihan's unruly Irish terrier, Dart passed a servant coming out the kitchen door and into the hall. Mr. Dooley made a beeline for the Indian interior minister and began energetically humping his leg. <laughs> it took the mortified house staff some effort to remove the determined dog from his mission. The boys on the balcony above couldn't contain their laughter, and Mrs. Moynihan had a hard time keeping a straight face herself when she admonished them later. Then uh, a few months later, also in Delhi, the GRU leadership uh, has sanctioned uh, Polyakov's relationship with my father, which is explained earlier in the book, allowing them to meet somewhat openly. In 1974, my sisters Maria and Claire took the spring semester off from college for a four-month stay in Delhi, Claire bringing along her boyfriend, Paul Finn. Paul was of Irish Catholic stock, and like his dad, uh, 
And like Dad, his father had gone to Boston College High School. Dad and Paul hit it off and spent time playing tennis at the embassy compound, going on sightseeing trips, and taking after-dinner walks around the neighborhood. Later, Dad told Claire that the IB fielders, Indian intelligence, and hence the KGB who paid the IB for information, thought Paul Finn was a new agent trainee and kept a close eye on what he and Dad were up to. Paul slept on a cot in the open-air Basarti room on the roof. One night, at around 3 a.m., he got up for a glass of water. Coming down the circular stairway, he, got up, um, he stopped when he heard my father talking in the foyer at the foot of the stairs where our one phone was located. Dad was speaking to someone animatedly in some other language. Paul didn't show himself, but he listened. Dad was speaking Russian. The next morning, Paul told my sister Claire, I heard your dad speaking Russian on the phone last night, fluently. Dad was speaking Russian. This was news to us. We knew he spoke German, Spanish, and some Italian, but how could it be that in all these years we hadn't known that he spoke Russian? Then, one evening, Mom and Dad told us that a Russian general was coming over to talk with Dad, and the two were not to be disturbed. Intrigued, the boys made sure they were in the foyer when the general came in, resplendent in his uniform with shoulder boards and a big military hat. The Russian looked down at them, amused by their bold approach, their long hair, tie-dyed t-shirt, and scruffy sandals. The man smiled and handed them each a candy from his coat pocket, then went into the den with my father. Dad locked the door behind them, something we'd never, he'd never done before. Wow, my brother Leo said, a Russian general. You don't see one of those every day. Thank you. So we have some time for Q&A. OK. Oh. And I'll come back. <laughs> I'm interested to find out, where did you get all those pictures? Are they from your own family, or did you uh, uh, do some research in, about the war? Um, <laughs> many of the pictures were from my own family. Many of the pictures were the private collection of the Polyakovs. The Polyakov family opened up their entire um, photo album for me. And uh, my husband and I took it and scanned, I think, 300 photos for them, because they had never digitized them. And then we selected them. They didn't actually have that many uh, photos left, because when their father was arrested uh, in Moscow in 1988, uh, the KGB came in and took everything away, all the personal possessions. They happened to have one small stash of photos that they had hidden away, and that's what they made available to me. Um, some of the other photos um, come from Russian uh, documentaries, where they've done a documentary on Polyakov, and you can screenshot them and use them. Uh, at least that's what my lawyer at HarperCollins said I could do. So, <laughs> so I did. <laughs> so it's a mix. Uh, of quite a different places. Thank you. Eva, just an um, intriguing story, brilliantly told. Thank you. Um, did you have to get any level of cooperation from the CIA or permission before you published the book? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, no, I did not have to, because um, I am not an employee of the CIA. Only employees of the CIA sign a secrecy agreement, and they have to then submit their uh, work through the Publication Review Board. Now, where the CIA does have some jurisdiction is if someone knowingly publishes uh, classified information, which I did not do. I had no interest in being arrested under US Code 798, the Disclosure of Classified Information Act. Thank you very much. So, but no, it didn't require, it didn't require. I'm just hiding back here, okay. Uh, Eva, I know this is a, an issue in our house. Um, in our house. So I, so I want to understand if, in fact, you feel like or you have any knowledge that your father shared his experiences and his work with your mother. And did she, if she knew, um, obviously she, she seemed not to tell you um, or, or the rest of the family. So I'm just curious to know what role you think she played in all of this. Was everybody able to hear it? I barely heard that. Did everybody hear that question? No. 
No? Uh, uh, he, he, he asked, you know, how much my mother knew and what role she might have played. Um, that is hard for me to answer because they honestly didn't tell us anything even years after my father was outed officially by the newspaper article and then my father died five years later. My mother lived on for 17 years and said very little. I believe she knew almost everything. Um, and she, she just you know, made a vow to my father or herself or whatnot. And I think that's one of the reasons why she left the box in the attic because you know, there was nothing classified in that box. It's just that she herself was never comfortable. It, she, it's the, it was that generation, you know. It was the gen same generation of, of uh, the, the greatest generation that came home from the war and then they didn't want to talk about the war, you know, they just wanted to move on. It was sort of that mentality where you just don't talk about it. But I believe she knew just about everything, absolutely. And she would tell us a thing or two every now and then, like the story in the book. I don't know how many people have actually read the book yet, but there's a story in the book uh, where um, they fire the, uh, one of our servants. In India, you, know, you hire a lot of help because you know, you're helping the economy, actually, by doing that. And we were so surprised that, she, that, uh, that they had fired Gupta, our, one of our favorite servants. And, um, but the day that she actually told us that, I almost died because I was 18 at the time. I had my first boyfriend. We were sneaking into the den in the evenings after my parents went to sleep and uh, fooling around. And my mother told me that the reason that they fired the um, servant was that he had placed a bug in the den. And I almost died in front of her <laughs> when, when my mother <laughs> <laughs> told me that. So uh, the, she told us a few things. Um, and actually, to answer further your question, like, you know, ha, what, was there any involvement? Actually, many CIA wives or husbands of, of people, there were many fewer of husbands who were spouses, but uh, wives did, would do things like run packages for their husbands, you know, do uh, dead drops and whatnot if they felt that they were safe. And so my mother told us that, that my father had once asked her to drop a, uh, a package at a dead drop site in a lonely, dark Berlin park. And she did it, and she came back and said, I will never <laughs> do that again. You know, I will never run another package for you. So that was the extent, I think, of my mother's part-time spying efforts, so. <laughs> Eva, this sounds terrific, and I can't wait to read it. Thank you. If uh, Boyakov turned in 6061, was he helpful in the Cuban Missile Crisis information flow? I found no um, research or information that um, connected him to the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis. It's very possible that he was, but I never found it. And that's um, the type of thing that I hope years from now when they declassify his files, that more detail about what he did com comes out. Because you know he was there at the time, so I think it's very possible, but I found nothing. Uh, of that, so I so I couldn't speculate or write about it. I think there we go. I have two questions. One, um, was it emotional to to meet Alexander? Uh, it was so emotional to meet Alexander that I, I would say I, I won't say I burst out crying. I have more control of my emotions than that, but I welled up, you know, because it just felt so. Uh, here I was talking to, you know, the son of the man that had, you know, had such a close relationship to my father and, and the man who I had studied for two or three years before I met Alexander, you know. So yes, it was very emotional and, and I was very pleased with our relationship. He, um, he was very supportive of the idea of publishing a book um, because He's an American now, and he has American children and American grandchildren, and he wanted the American version of this story told. Um, there are the Russian versions, plenty of them, you know, where he is a heinous traitor, which is understandable. Um, so he was very cooperative, and he turned out to be a lovely man and uh, uh, very supportive. His brother, again, for any of you who have read the book, you will find that his brother ended up not cooperating. Um, and he said his reason was that his wife 
uh, still travels to Moscow to visit his, her mother, and he was afraid that uh, the book would antagonize the, the Russian government and that they might get in the way of uh, his wife's travel. So in the end, he did not participate, but um, you know, uh, um, Alexander was so cooperative and so wonderful that he just really opened up the entire story. It which comes was, through that way. It does. Yes. Have you read the book? I have. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I loved it. But um, the other question I had was was more historical, and you. Oh, do I have to do that? I don't know. Yes. Um, was the James Angleton because he's a very controversial figure yes. in the, historically. Yes. And um, I, I kind of got the feeling that you came out on the, was it the white hat side or the? <laughs> on the white hat side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I most definitely came out on the white hat side. So, you know, Angleton, she's talking about the, the head of the CIA counterintelligence and, and uh, he believed in this vast Soviet master plot and he was a black hat and they never really used the phrase white hat, but. But my father was a white hat, you know, partly because that was his job. His job was to go out and recruit and find Soviets who would pass information. And my goodness, in the 50s and 60s, the Cuban Missile Crisis, all these things that were going on, they needed intelligence. And um, Angleton was so paranoid because of um, the experience he had had with Kim Philby in the book, I don't, don't want to tell the whole book for for people who haven't read it yet. But you know, he he bonded with Kim Philby, who turned out to be a British spy for the Russians, um, and he was sort of trained under him and all that sort of thing. And then was so shocked when he turned out to be a KGB spy that he decided that everybody could not be trusted. Um, and as a result, he really decimated a good decade of of our intelligence agencies being able to get any kind of good Soviet intelligence during the height of the Cold War. Um, and because of the fact that uh, uh, Angleton did not trust Polyakov specifically and tried to undermine him, and then, as you read in the book, actually so went so far as to out him uh, in the American press, which could have you know, been one of the reasons that helped his you know, demise, yes, I was uh, more of a fan of the white hats than the black hats, for sure. As I think many people. Yes. Have you ha has there been? Sorry. Have there been any reactions to the book from the Russian government, from the Russian press? Uh, I'll tell you a little inside story, which is um, I was uh, driving up to D.C. a couple weeks ago, and I called Alexander and I said, "I'm coming up. Can we have dinner?" because I really hadn't, I'd been so busy with the promotion of the book and whatnot, whatnot, and I hadn't had a whole lot of communication with him. And he said, yes, let's have dinner. And then he wrote this very cryptic message, the lion has awoken and roars in anger. And, and it, now he tends to sometimes, if he wants to tell me something that he doesn't want the whole world to, you know, because Soviets that were raised during that time they still believe everybody's listening in and spying on them and everything. The, the lion has awoken and roared in anger. And I read this and I said, oh my goodness, oh, yikes. And I didn't even think to call him earlier to find out what the reaction was. I'm like all so selfishly in my own promotion and running around. And I said, what is it, what is he? He said, we better talk about it at dinner. So like, you know, oh, I'm driving up there and going, you know, the, the KGB is gonna be sending somebody to, you know, assassinate him or something. And we finally sit down to dinner. And it turned out that the lion was the CIA because when he came here, he signed an agreement with the CIA because the CIA sponsored the two boys or men at the, at the point that, that they came in their 30s uh, and set them up here and uh, you know got them started on their own way. And, and they signed agreements not to tell their stories to journalists, not to go on to a journalist. Well, um, Alexander, if you remember from the book, got a law degree. That was one of the degrees he got at the Moscow State University. And he technically told the CIA, I didn't tell my story to a journalist because while my career was in magazine publishing, I was on the business side. I was a marketer. I was a salesperson, circulation. I was never a journalist. He said, I did not tell my story to a journalist. I told myself my story to a daughter. And <laughs> you know what? They went, they said, okay, okay. You know, they kind of 
they didn't do anything like, like blow up his house or anything. So, <laughs> but, but I thought that was kind of a funny little story. And I was very glad that it was not the Russians who were, um, you know, there's so many books written about the Russians, you know, Red Notice, you know, all these other books. The Russians can't keep track of and, and come, I'm there, I, I think they're definitely coming after Bill Browder, but not the rest of us, not the rest of us. <laughs> not me, not little old me, or, or, or Alexander, I don't think, no. Uh, th thanks for your book. I went on Amazon. You had over 100 reviews. They were all positive. Thank you, thank you. It's kind of astounding. I mean, there's usually a few... Uh, disgruntled uh, customers, uh, but uh, so so the uh, you know I I'm kind of concerned about the this excessive classification you know I mean uh, you'd think the 60s 50s you know even maybe the 70s the declassification of documents for you you know would be very desirable for a democratic society you know there's the old saying you know we're only as sick as our secrets wouldn't it what? be healthy to release things that don't affect uh, current operations or living former agents? I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I filed probably about eight to 10 FOIA, you know, freedom of information requests, and they all came back denied. And it was really frustrating because that's a 30-year-old case. You know, there really is, I mean, maybe I don't know something, but I kind of suspect that's just the CIA being the CIA. And it does seem unproductive and unhelpful. We can all learn you know, so much from opening up some of these files. And as I said, I hope that they do eventually. And I hope that some very good journalist or historian writes the, the much the, the, the deeper. This was the human interest side story of Polyakov um, with as much of his spy um, you know, history that I could get my hands on. But someone, I hope, will when they do open it up. But I agree with you. I think it's counterproductive and, and silly. And, and, and we should know more. Absolutely. We have time for one or two more questions. Oh, OK, hold there. on. <laughs> if she talks really loud, I can just. <laughs> <laughs> I know your father didn't talk with you about his career, but did he mention anything when this dear friend of his was arrested, um, when Foyakov was arrested by the Russians? Was there any knowledge amongst the family that a dear friend of your father's has potentially been sentenced to death? My father died in 1980, and uh, Polyakov was arrested in 86 and executed in 88. Oh, so, so your father had no uh, idea. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, if there, if there is any silver lining to how I feel about my father's early death, the only beautiful part of it was that he did not know what happened to Polyakov, but uh, we did not know. And we really didn't know anything until we read that magazine article, of, because we didn't know who Polyakov was or anything like that. So. But I say, luckily, my father did not know, because I think that I understand from readings and from many conversations I had with Suzanne Grimes, the one with the pretty 60s, 70s dress on, and she worked on the account for a long time and worked closely with my father a long time. He said that they had a very close relationship, so I'm glad he didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I will just say thank you again to Eva for all of your storytelling. We are just so delighted to have you here. You. And um, books will still be for sale in the lobby and we are